Good morning. It's good to see everybody. Have several visitors with us, also a good number of our own who have been traveling and have come home. It's good to see you. We're excited about this opportunity to worship God, a God that we can trust. And we trust him in not just the large things of life, but the small everyday decisions that we make. And how crucial that is for each and every one of us to remember that we build ourselves spiritually when we trust God in all that we do. Because he is a God that loves us and wants what's best for us. In the 40th Psalm, we read this. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to the Lord. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Let's enter worship today with a full heart and full trust in God. you first loved us. You have shown us your loving kindness, your mercy, your grace. You have never done anything unloving toward us. You have done everything for our good. You are our creator. You are our Lord, our Savior. You are perfect in every way. And this is why we love you. And this is why we are here today to serve you as our God. We pray that, that as much as we love you, that we will love each other, that we will 
be patient with one another, that we will bear with one another, that we will be united in our worship to you today as brothers and sisters, as part of your family. As we worship you, help us to worship you in the right way and with the right heart. Help us to, to focus on the words that we sing, the words that we say, the words that others say as we are listening to your word being preached this morning. Help us to love you more with every day that you give us. Help us to be more loving, to practice your words, to put them to practice in our life, and to be more like you with every new day that you give to us. And help us to be thankful for all that you have done and that all that you do continue to do for us. Thank you for giving us each other as brothers and sisters. And thank you for giving us this day that we can worship you together. We pray all of these things through your son's name. Amen. So prepare now for the Lord's Supper. We'll sing Beautiful Lamb. Supper, I invite you to think on a simple yet profound aspect of our daily life. I want you to think about your hands. Hands hold a symbolic significance in the act of accepting Jesus Christ during the serving, uh, serving of the communion, as well as in our broader service to him each day. As we extend our hands to receive the bread and to receive the cup, we physically and we spiritually open ourselves 
to accept Jesus. Our outstretched hands become a symbol of our willingness to receive his grace and the mercy he's shown. In this simple gesture, our hands embody our acceptance of Christ's sacrifice and our commitment to a life serving him and to living by his teachings. But the story of hands in the Bible isn't always one of grace and acceptance. Hands have reached out to both touch Jesus' pierced side and his pierced hands and to believe, but those hands have also pushed Jesus away in rejection. Think, for example, of Judas, Judas Iscariot. His hands accepted 30 pieces of silver in exchange for betraying Jesus. That's recorded in Matthew 26, 14 through 16. His hands, which once broke bread with the Savior, in that recorded scripture, became instruments of betrayal. In contrast, consider the hands of our Savior himself. Hands that healed the sick, blessed children, and were ultimately stretched out on the cross for you and I. His hands, which broke the bread, shared with Judas and the other apostles in Luke 22, symbolize the ultimate act of love and sacrifice. As we think about our Father God, the Bible often speaks of God and his hands as instruments of justice and protection. I'll read from Psalm 17, so I think we can embody these words. We see in the book of Psalm 17, verses 5 through 7, that David speaks of God's saving hand. My steps have held fast to your paths. My feet have not slipped. I have called upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me, hear my speech. Wondrously show your loving kindness, O Savior, of those who take refuge at your right hand from those who rise up against them. So we know that God's hands are a refuge. They're a strength for the faithful. Yet those same hands also bring justice, as we see in the writings captured in the Old Testament, where God's hands brought plagues upon Egypt to free his people. This was ultimately the Passover for God's people. But for the Egyptians, we know in Hebrews 10.31, we're reminded that it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Our hands, much like we read about in scriptures, have the power to hurt and also the power to heal, to reject and also to serve. As followers of Christ, we are called to ensure that our hands do not become tools of betrayal or of harm. Instead, we must strive to use our hands as Jesus did, to serve. In the simple act of serving or partaking in the communion this morning, our hands become a metaphor for our broader spiritual journey. Do we use our hands to embrace Christ and his teachings, or do we, like Judas, use them to betray? So let us remember the power, the symbolism of our hands as we dip our hands into the plate that's being passed this morning. Let our hands be extensions of Christ's love, instruments of his peace, and emblems of our service to him, reflecting the love and grace of Jesus Christ. We'll ask the men to come up and serve and offer a prayer for the bread at this time. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we are humbled at this time as we think about your son's sacrifice for us. It is hard for us to comprehend the amount of love that you have for us, Lord. As we think about the bread that we are about to partake, we ask that you'd bless it bless it and we ask that you will guide our guide our hearts guide our thoughts help us to really focus on that sacrifice that your son did for us and what and what it means for us god we're so thankful for him and for the love that you've shown us god it's in jesus name that we pray amen
Let's pray for the fruit of the vine. Almighty Father, we're mindful fully of your greatness. We're mindful that you have power that we can't even put numbers to. You have wisdom that reaches to us over thousands of years and still applies to every minute of our days. We are small and weak compared to your power and greatness, yet we're reminded of your service towards us by these emblems, by the events that we're meant to remember by these emblems. We are the small ones, but you served us As only you could, Father, you let your son go to the cross and serve us in a way that we needed, that we required for the forgiveness of our sins. The blood of Jesus, your precious son, should have never spilled on the ground and been dishonored, but you allowed that to happen because you loved us so much. Father, we pray that we give you the respect and the love that you deserve at this moment and with all of our lives. We pray that we concentrate fully on this emblem of the fruit of the vine and remember the death that your son died for our sins. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
concludes our taking of the Lord's Supper. I'll draw your minds now to think one us for the material blessings that we've been given. I'm turning to my Bible to Mark 12. I'll read from verses 41 through 44. Mark 12, starting in verse 41. Speaking of Jesus, and he sat down opposite the treasury and began observing how the people were putting money into the treasury and how many rich people were putting in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which amount to a cent. Calling his disciples to him, he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the contributors to the treasury. For they all put in out of their surplus, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she owned, all that she had to live on. Likewise, with our own hands, We've had the opportunity to put money into our treasury boxes at the entrance to our building as we came in this morning. Let us pray that this money is used to God's glory. If you'll bow with me, we'll offer a prayer to God. Father God, we are thankful for the opportunity to pause and to reflect on the many ways that you have continued to give us so many things in this life one of which is financially, whether it be large sums of money or the widow's might. God, we are grateful for what we have, and we recognize that you are the giver of all good things. Please bless our church, bless our leadership as we use the funds that have been collected here today to do good for other Christians, to help spread your gospel, and ultimately to bring you glory. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen. For the lesson, we'll sing two songs. The first one will be Sweet Hour of Prayer.
sinner come. A scripture reading will be taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 13. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Again, that's 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 13. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know, just as I also am known. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Good morning, and happy New Year's Eve. It's good to see everybody out today on the last day of 2023. There's no better way to to spend the final day of a year than in worship together. We're going to kind of lean into that idea this morning. Here we are on the last day of the year. Pretty much everything that you were going to do and everything that has happened in 2023 is now behind us. And for a lot of us, 2023 was a life-changing year. Uh, It certainly was for my family, and I know it was for others as well. Some of you got married in 2023. Some of you got engaged in 2023. Some had children. Some lost a spouse in 2023 or someone else close to them. For probably all of us, each year makes a mark on our lives. And when we're at the very end of that year, it gives us the opportunity to think back about what the year had in store for us and how that manifested in our lives. It gives us the opportunity to look at the blank slate, so to speak, of 2024 that lies ahead of us as we wonder what that year may bring. Most often, we never think about some of the drastic changes that a year may bring to us until we're in it. What lies in store for us for 2024, we'll see. But today gives us an opportunity to think back about what this year was and to think ahead about what 2024 can be. And so as we do that, I want to draw your attention to the theme that we have been considering over the last four months as a congregation. If you think all the way back to September... Keith presented a lesson laying out the theme for this last trimester of the year, Committed Christianity. Now, I'm going to tell you, I've got this title up here on the screen. Last night, Bella was getting ready for bed, and she asked me what my sermon was about this morning, and I told her that my title was Commit to Being Committed in 2024. She gave me one of these. That didn't make any sense. (laughs) I thought that was kind of clever, but she's like, no, that that didn't make any sense. I was like, well, I'm sorry. And she goes, well, I just hope the sermon is better than the title. So with that in mind, we're going to get this off the screen, and we're going to move on because now I'm self-conscious about my title this morning. But after Keith's lesson in September about the theme for this last trimester of the year, Jeremy and I sat down in his office, and we began to break down that theme using Keith's lesson as our template for that. And he and I made the decision 
that for each Sunday, for the rest of the year, on Sunday mornings, we were going to present a lesson that was connected to the theme for this trimester. And so what you'll see on the screen behind me is Jeremy's whiteboard in his office as we brainstormed using Keith's the keynote and his lesson that he, he gave to us, and we broke down each of these lessons that we wanted to present over the course of the trimester, and the green check marks represent those lessons being preached. Now, that's a lot. That's a lot on this board, and some of those sermons that we preached, we didn't necessarily draw attention to the fact that they were connected to the theme, but each one of them was And I think it's extremely helpful. It has been for me this week as I engaged in what I'm going to ask you to engage in this morning with me, thinking back about this theme and and all of the things that we have studied and all of the things that we have talked about as a congregation over the past few months. Now, all of that is behind us, but let's not forget what the theme was, committed Christianity. Commitment is an ongoing effort. Commitment isn't something that stops as the year ends and a new year and a new theme begins starting next week. Committed Christianity means I'm going to take all of these things that we've studied, all of these things that we've talked about, and I'm going to put them into practice in my life moving forward. That's committed Christianity. And so I want all of us to go through this practice together this morning of looking back on what we have talked about and then thinking of ways in which we are going to put those things into practice in our lives in 2024. And so as we do that, I'm going to give you the blank slate and we're going to work through this a little bit as we begin to think of ways in which we can put each of these big headers into practice in our lives. But before we do that, I want to turn your attention to the 37th Psalm. If you'll turn over there with me. This, this is a psalm that has for a long time caught my attention and one that I've referenced back to many times. It's a psalm written by David, and, and largely within this psalm, he's contrasting the wicked or the evil man with the righteous. And as David looks around, he sees wicked people that are excelling in life, wicked people that are wealthy, wicked people that are powerful, and he, he's wondering why, why are these wicked individuals prospering? Uh, but then through this psalm, as he deals with what he sees and what he knows about God, he comes to the realization that while wickedness may prosper for a period of time, The righteous who serve God are the ones that will have the victory. But with that idea in mind, look specifically with me, beginning in verse number 3 of this psalm. And I want you to think about this in relation to the theme that we have been talking about over the past four months. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light, and your justice as the noonday. You see, this idea of being committed to God, Moment by moment, we may look around and we may see that wickedness seems to be prospering. Wickedness seems to be rewarding those who reject God and turn away from him. But as David points out here, if you commit your way to the Lord, and if you trust in him, he will bring forth your righteousness. You will be rewarded for that. And so as we think about being committed to God going into 2024, let's never forget the fact that God is a rewarder of those who commit themselves to him. Feed on his word. Trust in him. Dwell with him. And he will bring forth your righteousness. 
there's a great reward that awaits all of us if we truly practice ongoing commitment to the Lord. So as you think about the big pillars on the screen behind me, I want to ask you this morning, how are you going to commit yourself to God in 2024? What are you going to do to make your worship and your prayer life more dynamic and more genuine? What steps are you going to take to live more sacrificially, following the example of Christ? You see, these are the kind of questions that we need to be asking ourselves as we enter into a new year. Me and my life and my family and my home, how am I going to commit myself more fully to God? What am I going to do to make sure that my prayer life is strong and vibrant? What am I going to do to make sure that my worship to God is genuine and full of enthusiasm and excitement? You see, commitment to God isn't something that's just going to happen. It takes effort on our part. And so each of us, what are we going to do to take all of the things we've talked about in regards to being committed to God and put them into practice so that we can truly be committed Christians in 2024? When it comes to being committed to God through spiritual growth, some questions to ask yourself. How will you commit to moving forward spiritually, giving your all in service to God and to others? We talked about the dangers of remaining stagnant. We need to be pushing forward. We need to be growing, actively involved in growing in our spirituality, growing in our service, both to God and to others. How will you become more spiritually minded and recognizing your deep need for God in 2024? You know, one of the big themes that Jesus deals with as we read about his story in all four gospel accounts, perhaps John, the gospel writer, brings it out more than others, but it's present in every gospel account. Jesus constantly battling with those around him who are thinking and viewing the world strictly through a physical perspective. And Jesus challenges them to see things more spiritually, to rise above the, the physical nature that we feel and touch and see around us and view our lives, view eternity the way that God does. What are you going to do in 2024 to become more spiritually minded? What are you going to do to increase your depth of knowledge as it pertains to God's Word? How are you going to draw closer to Him and recognize the emptiness of life without God's presence in it? What are the steps that you are going to take in 2024? What about your family? You think about the physical family that you have. What are you going to do to fulfill your role as a mother or a father or a husband or a wife within your home? We, we had lessons that talked about the roles of husbands and wives and mothers and fathers, roles that God designed and gave to us. What are we going to do in 2024 to commit ourselves to fulfilling those roles and living into the purpose that God gave us as mothers and fathers and husbands and wives? What are we going to do to minimize or eliminate the distractions that this world is constantly pestering us with? What are we going to do to establish our priorities within our home? And to make sure that no matter what, we are going to protect those priorities and align those priorities with God. If we don't take active steps in the direction of doing that, the world will make sure that those priorities are replaced. We cannot let that happen. So what are you going to do in your homes to make sure 
that the priority of serving God, of loving others, of growing closer to Him, has its rightful place in your home in 2024? What about our commitment to the lost? How are we going to improve in our efforts to seek the lost the way that Jesus did and to share the gospel every opportunity that we have? It's very easy to be scared away from sharing the gospel with someone because we fear how they may respond or how they may react to us. What are some steps that we're going to take to be more evangelistic in 2024? Individually, each one of us, what can we do? Who, who are we around each day that we can have a positive spiritual influence on? And what are the steps we're going to take to make sure that we have that influence and that we open the doors of conversation with people that we have an opportunity to talk with? And finally, as we consider the church family, our local body here at Traders Point, what can you do in 2024 to commit yourself to being more of a giver and less of a taker? What can you do to build up someone else in love? What can you do to promote humility and kindness Are you going to commit yourself to being willing to forgive? To being willing to move on and to focus on doing your part to make this local body of Christians here at Traders Point stronger and more unified? You see, those things aren't going to just happen. They're not going to just happen because Jeremy and I preached on them a few times. It's going to take purposeful action on the part of each one of us for this congregation to remain unified, for this congregation to grow in faith, for this congregation to be a light in this community, each one of us is going to have to do our part to make sure that the church here continues to grow and to be everything that God wants it to be. When you think about, we, we, we spent quite a bit of time in Ephesians chapter 4 and Romans chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Passages of scripture that specifically talk about the individual talents and abilities that God has given to each of us and the need for the local church to have all of those pieces working together in order for it to be everything that God designed it to be. That means every single person sitting here this morning has to commit to doing your part. We have to commit to examining ourselves and the talents and the abilities and the opportunities that God has given to us and then using them in every way that we can to help the Lord's church grow, to help it thrive in this community, and to help our faith individually and collectively to grow stronger. What steps are you going to take in each of these in 2024? I would encourage you, jot down some of these questions. If you want this slide, I'd be happy to give it to you. I know the font's probably kind of small. Some of you may have a hard time reading that. I'd be happy to send this to you if that would be of help to you in any way. But give some consideration to these questions. And think about tangible ways in which you can respond to these questions going into the new year. We're going to have a new theme, we're going to move on, we're going to be talking about other things, but if we truly want to be committed to Christ, committed to God, it is going to require our ongoing effort, not just in 2024, but in the years beyond as the Lord gives us. You know, I was thinking a lot this week as I was going through some of these questions and and thinking about the the last day of the year and the opportunity to speak as, as we conclude a year and how I wanted to kind of tie all of this together and, and bring it to a close. And where I settled is not my words, but God's. And I'm going to ask you to turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 8. In 1 Kings chapter 8, 
we see here the completion of the temple. Solomon has finished what his father David envisioned and put into motion. Solomon has completed the temple. And 1 Kings chapter 8 tells us about Solomon's prayer that he offers as the temple work is complete and the Ark of the Covenant is brought into that. And then beginning in verse number 54, he turns his attention to the people of Israel. And he offers to them a blessing. First, he turns his attention to praise to God for his faithfulness and his steadfastness, and then to the people. And it's these words that I want to leave us with as we conclude 2023. And as I read these, I I want you to put yourself in the place of the Israelites who would have been hearing these words. Because I believe this blessing that Solomon offers is timeless. And it is one that has impacted me as I've read it, and especially as we consider everything that we've talked about this morning. I think it's an appropriate way to bring the year to a close. Beginning in verse number 54 of 1 Kings chapter 8. When Solomon had finished all these prayers and supplications to the Lord, he rose from before the altar of the Lord, where he had been kneeling with his hands spread out toward heaven. He stood and blessed the whole assembly of Israel in a loud voice, saying, Praise be to the Lord, who has given rest to his people Israel, just as he promised. Not one word has failed of all the good promises he gave through his servant Moses. May the Lord our God be with us, as he was with our ancestors. May he never leave us, nor forsake us. May he turn our hearts to him to walk in obedience to him, and to keep the commands, decrees, and laws that he gave our ancestors. And may these words of mine, which I have prayed before the Lord, be near to the Lord our God day and night, that he may uphold the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel according to each day's need, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God, and that there is no other. And may your hearts be fully committed to the Lord our God, to live by his decrees, and obey his commands, as at this time. May your hearts be fully committed to the Lord our God, May you live by his decrees and obey his commands going into 2024. Now Solomon's desire for the people of Israel was certainly noble. I think it should be our desires for each other this morning as well. Our desires for the local body here at Traders Point As we begin a new year and we await whatever is in store for us in 2024, if we fully commit ourselves to the Lord, if we live by his decrees and obey his commands, then the sky is the limit for us in 2024. If we live by his commands and we obey him fully, then the sky is the limit for your family in 2024. The sky is the limit for your personal growth as a Christian in 2024. The sky is the limit as you prepare to teach a Bible class in 2024. The sky is the limit as you seek to influence others in your life in 2024. Just as David saw, as we read in Psalm 37, you may look around and you may see wickedness seeming to excel in this life, but never forget that God rewards the righteous. And for us individually, there is no limit to what we can accomplish if our hearts are fully committed to the Lord our God. And if we live 
by his decrees and obey his commands. That should be what all of us are striving to do as we begin a new year. But as we conclude the year and conclude the sermon this morning, I also want you to reflect, as we've been doing some today already, on the life that you have lived and the decisions that you've made and the choices that you've made in the year that is now behind us. Are those decisions, are those choices reflective of someone who has committed themselves to God fully? If your life in 2023 was an open book to each of us, Would it be obvious that you have chosen to commit yourself to God? Well, my prayer is that it would be. But I also understand for some that may not be the case. And the good news is that we have a God who has been patient and long-suffering. A God who has brought us to the end of another year waiting for those who haven't yet committed themselves to him to do just that. We don't have a promise that 2024 will begin at midnight tonight. But we do have an opportunity right now to examine our lives and to ask ourselves if we have committed ourselves to God. Is every part of who you are God's? Are you following him? Are you striving to grow spiritually? I hope that you are, and I hope that you continue to do so as long as God gives you breath. But if you're not, and you're ready to make that decision to commit your life to God, to become a child of his, be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, there's no greater time to do that than right now. If there's anything that we can do to help you, anything that we can do, to to help your walk with Christ, please come to the front and let us know how we can help as we stand and sing. announcements to make before we're dismissed this morning. I'll reiterate to our guests with us this morning, thank you very much for being here. We really appreciate you coming our way, and we just want you to know that um, you're always welcome to be with us at any opportunity that you have. You are our honored guest, and, and please come back and see us. It's also good to see 
another uh, Roberts family with us this morning, Andrew and his family. I haven't seen them in a long time, but it's wonderful to have you here this morning. The next time that we'll meet here will be Wednesday night at 7 p.m. for Bible study. We will not meet here um, this evening. Our new trimester classes also start a week from today, the 7th. So I know John Morgan and Andrew Yader both told me that their materials are ready in the far foyer, but I believe all the materials for the new classes are, are out in the foyer. So whatever class you signed up to be a part of, make sure you pick up your materials for those new classes starting um, next Sunday. Just one other quick announcement. Uh, our traditions service will pick up next Sunday um, afternoon, and Tim Arden is going to send out an email this afternoon. There's still some spots needed to take care of that service at uh, traditions next Sunday. I'll make sure I also send out an email with everyone that uh, let us know they were sick, working, or traveling today. So that's all the announcements I have. If you want to go ahead and stand up, we're going to see, sing song number 73, and then Dustin is going to offer a closing prayer. Those with Lord reign in me. Over all the earth, you reign on high, every mountain stream, every sunset sky, but my one request, Lord, my only aim, is that you reign in me again, Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams. Approaching your throne at the conclusion of our worship service, thankful for this opportunity that we had to worship you. We pray that our worship was pleasing to you. And Lord, as we look back on our lives this year, we're just so thankful for all the many blessings that you've given us, Lord. We know every single blessing that we have come, come from you, and as we, we reflect on the good things that happened to us this year, we know that your hand was involved with that. Lord, we're so thankful for all, the, all those blessings, and we, we pray that you, uh, as we also reflect on this past year, and we reflect on the trials that we may have gone through, we know that those, those trials strengthen us, and we pray that you always help us keep that perspective and know that through the, through the hard times, they refine us and help for, for us to have wisdom that we can remember that you are in control of our lives and help us to you know, provide that wisdom to others who may be going through those trials, Lord. Lord, as we depart from here and we embark on a new year, we pray that you be with us. We pray that you help each and every one of us examine our lives and examine our commitment to you. 
we pray that you help us to remember that there is nothing more important in our lives than, than serving you, Lord. Help for us to be committed and sacrifice our, wills to, our will to you. Help for us to commit our lives to just growing spiritually day by day. Help for us to commit our lives to prayer and meditation and service to others, Lord. Lord, we also help, help us commit our, in the next year, help us commit to our, our physical families. Help for us to embrace the rules that you've given to us. We look, we look among the world and we see lots of broken families. And we see the breakdown that happens whenever people don't fulfill the rules that you've given them. And we pray that you help us to be committed to, to stepping up and, and being the best that we can be as fathers, as mothers, and as children, Lord. We, help, we pray that you help us glorify you in that endeavor. Lord, we, we pray that you be with us in our commitment to our church family here. We know that each one of us make up a part of the body. Help us to be good stewards of the talents that you've given us and not hide them. And help for us to, to work together because we know, that, we know the devil is after us. And we look around us, we see congregations splitting. And we, we pray that you help for us to to come together and stri always strive towards unity. Lord, we pray that you be with us in our commitment towards the lost, those outside the body of Christ. It's very intimidating when we look upon the world. We know that we see the devil at work. We, and it's easy for us to give in to fear and to not want to go out there and for us to retreat back and in, in, in to our, our comfort zones. Help for us to know that People are seeking out there, and and while we we just we need just need to be we just need to have the courage to go out there and to to spread the word, Lord, and help for us to live our lives and commit to ourselves to live our lives in a way that glorifies you and shines light as to who you are, and so that others can find you. Be with us as we depart from here. We pray that you help us to always put you first in our lives and we, we pray for your forgiveness for the times that we don't we love you so much lord we're so thankful for everything through jesus name we pray amen